Hello. I'm solving this bio paper today. Paper 4. 9700 variant 42. February March 2022. The syllabus has slightly changed. There have been new additions to the syllabus, specific parts of it, and some of it has been removed. Like we don't have C4 plants anymore in our syllabus starting from 2022. The European Hedgehog is a small omnivorous mammal. Its body is covered in spines, which are usually brown. A rare variant, which lacks the brown pigment, has blonde, pale yellow spines. The characteristic is coded for by a recessive allele. Okay. It's kind of cute. Alderney is a small island between the UK and France. Hedgehogs were not found on Alderney until the 1960s. When three pairs of hedgehogs were introduced to the island, the hedgehogs started to breed and some of the offspring had blonde spines. Okay. So it's a recessive characteristic. So over some time, we saw that the offspring had these blonde spines. Typically, we did not find them in that island, but when they were introduced, we started seeing these hedgehogs, right, with these blonde spines. So this is an example of the founder effect, right? When you bring a small proportion of the population to another island, even if the allele did not exist there, even if it's recessive, since they're gonna mate with themselves, right? The only chance of passing on another allele is their recessive one. Even if it's recessive, it's going to be passed on because the dominant allele does not exist in the population, right? That That is the basics. By 2017, the population of hedgehogs, including individuals with brown spines and individuals with blonde spines, had increased to approximately 600. Suggest reasons why the population of hedgehogs increased to such a large number. Okay, so when do hedgehogs, when do the size... When does the size of the population increase? There was an example in the course book of rabbits when they were introduced to Australia. Their population increased a lot, which required culling ultimately. This usually happens when there is a lack of predators, okay? That's one of them, or th if there's no disease affecting them. So, the reasons include a high birth rate or a short generation time to make kids basically then there may be few or no predators there might be little competition right there may be no or few fewer diseases comparatively compared to the original island they might be well adapted to that environment over there or you could say that there may be no selection pressure against them you can describe this okay what is the last point there might be you know there may be plenty of food available okay or you could say that wide range of food types eaten since uh, the hedgehog is an omnivore right since omnivore so these are the points this is a common question let's move on a survey taken in 2017 showed that 60 percent of the hedgehogs on alderney had blonde spines even though it's recessive suggesting explain reasons why the proportion with blind spines was so high which is not supposed to happen right Typically, we see that the dominant characteristic, you know, is in greater proportion, which is supposed to be the brown pigment. But here we're seeing that 60% has the recessive characteristic. What may the reasons be? So basically, you, you I was talking about the founder effect, right? Or genetic drift that's one reason then there was a small gene pool at the start which actually led to inbreeding so there was no other choice also there might be another thing maybe the blonde spines had a selective advantage in this island maybe the island was um, yellowish had yellow leaves or something so they could get camouflage maybe brown hedgehogs were seen more easily these might be reasons okay 
so it may be due to directional selection right what's direction selection suppose this is brown and this is yellow basically yellow having yellow spines gave you an ad advantage so you had a higher tendency to pass on your alleles to the next gen right so blonde spines have a selective advantage okay so over time what happens over time the allele frequency for blonde spines actually increases or you could say there is increased homozygosity do you understand there's increased homozygosity for recessive for recessive alleles okay what else we can talk about the other points right the ones i i was talking about um inbreeding may have occurred right inbreeding may have occurred oh, we know for sure that inbreeding has occurred right uh, there was a small gene pool at the start or you could say that there was little genetic variation you could also refer to the founder effect or you know genetic drift when you bring a small proportion of the main population to another island or you know the bottleneck effect what is this when a large population suddenly disappears we lose a large uh, amount of the gene pool okay the hedgehogs on Aldrin are an example of an invasion of an alien species or an invasive alien species uh, why is it important to control invasive alien species mainly because they disrupt the food chain okay basically there will be less food available for other organisms right this is a really important question mainly they compete with so one type of species is an invasive species another type is a native species so they compete with native species okay how for you know food or maybe they occupy the same niche right for light resources or you could say they reduce food source of native species okay this is one point so the first point is competition and then this is the second point right you could either add this or that okay moving on they feed on or they may be predators they may be predators of native species okay so it may actually lead to like they can cause extinction in native species right also they can breed successful they can breed more successfully right they can breed more successfully with native species also I was talking about the food webs and food chains right and hedgehogs uh, usually do not have natural predators typically that's why their numbers increase so much so okay so they often have no natural predators okay what else basically an alien species might they may disrupt habitats okay they may disrupt habitats ecosystems or you know food chains 
food webs, anything works. And also they may introduce some new disease. They may introduce a disease and ultimately they may reduce. They may cause a reduction in biodiversity. So this is also a very common question. Okay? Sorry, biodiversity. Like, uh, I've seen these questions come like three, four years back about the importance of controlling an alien species and also why do numbers increase so much, okay? Really important. Okay, so for number two, we have GAN, Giant Exonal Neuropathy. It is a rare autosomal recessive disease which affects neurons. Neurons are nerve cells, basically. So what is neuropathy, if you guys want to know? It's basically damage to nerves. It can occur due to vitamin deficiency or due to infections. Or it may be genetic, as seen here. Mitochondria can move freely within the exons of neurons. We need mitochondria, right? It's a powerhouse, powerhouse of the cell to provide ATP to pump ions out for action potentials. In GN, the exons of neurons become enlarged and blocked by the accumulation of specific proteins. This prevents the free movement of mitochondria and affects the transmission of action potentials along the exon membrane. So just to explain why preventing the free movement of mitochondria within the cytoplasm of the exon affects the transmission of action potentials along the exon membrane. Interesting. I was telling you guys, right? Basically, the resting membrane potential is mainly maintained by the sodium potassium pump, which pumps three po sodium out and two potassium in. This is an active process. It's provided by ATP, right? So, mainly, if mitochondria is not able to move, no or less ATP will be produced. For whom exactly? For the sodium potassium pump. Or you could just say for the active transport of sodium and potassium. Okay, that works. Now, what does this prevent? What's the issue? This prevents, or you could say this reduces, the re-establishment of the resting membrane potential. Do you guys understand? Like, after the depolarization has occurred, and repolarization, there's an overshoot, right? Or hyperpolarization. So we need to get the RMP back. So typically the sodium potassium pump helps us to do this. It will take more time to re-establish it. As a result, think about it. If hyperpolarization, so this is a typical action potential, right? Check this out. If hyperpolarization takes longer, what, what's the main issue? the refractory period is going to be longer, right? So it's going to take longer for the neuron to be active again. This reduces transmission of action potentials along the exon. So any two points from these is fine. A nerve conduction velocity NCV test can be used to measure the speed of transmission of nerve impulses along neurons in different parts of the body. NCV tests were carried out on three people with GA and the speed of transmission of nerve impulses was measured in neurons in two nerves. The median nerve, it's one of the main nerves in the arm, and the peroneal nerve, it's one of the main nerves of the leg, okay? Table 2.1 shows the NCV test results for the three people with GAN and the expected range for a person without GAN. Okay. So in each person, as we can see, the value is lower than what we've expected, right? There is one anomaly though, this one. In person one, the and there is one anomaly, it's within the range. So with reference to table 2.1, when they tell you to refer to a table, you need to 
talk about data. So in general, we're going to talk about the trend. Having GAN actually reduces the speed, right? So GAN actually decreases or reduces speed. Or we can say that there is lower speed than expected. Okay, cool. In both, in both nerves. Or you could say in both the uh, median and peroneal nerve okay or you could say in both the arm and leg it's fine now we can talk about data we can say that we can talk about person 3 43 and 28 right or something we can just go median nerve with GN that's why 3 meter per second in person 3 okay and same without GN we expected it to be around 50 to 65 right same person okay but we can talk about that that guy person 1 right person 1 is actually unaffected or person 1 is not affected so much okay makes sense Walking requires nervous control to coordinate movements. One of the first signs of GN is having problems with walking. Typically, what we see of peripheral neuropathy, vitamin deficiency, infections, GBS. It, it starts from the periphery, okay? It slowly goes towards the center. Typically, this is what we see. Explain how the speed of transmission of nerve impulses in people with GN, GN can affect walking. Okay, so... Muscles are effectors, right? Basically, we need to send an impulse from our brain to the muscle at the leg. The leg muscles, right? And then they contract. So if it takes longer, it's going to take more time to walk, right? So periphery is affected more, clearly. So it takes longer for impulses to reach... neuromuscular junctions or muscles we can say that there uh, there are there are fewer or slower muscle contractions okay so we can talk about a problem what problem arises actually Mainly we can say that walking is slower, walking is slower, or the person may trip, right, or the person may stumble, reduce muscle control, and he may also have, you know, he or she may also have slower reflexes. These are the probable issues, so any two out of these four. It is caused by a mutation in a gene that goes for protein known as giga, uh, gigs, gigaxonin. Okay, gigaxonin. Scientists have tested gene therapy in mice with GN. What do we use for gene therapy? Viruses, right? Liposomes. And plasmids, right? So in one study, viral vectors containing a functioning allele of one gene that goes for gigaxonin were made. Mice with GN were treated with one dose of these viral vectors at 12 months of age. Six months after treatment, when the mice were 18 years old, the scientists used a rotorot test to measure the effect of the gene therapy. What is this? In the rotorot test, the length of time the mice are able to balance on a moving platform is recorded. The longer the length of the time the mice can balance on the moving platforms, the better their neuron activity. Okay. The rotor test was repeated on the same mice each month until the mice were 23 months old. The test was also carried out at the same time, intervals and ages, on mice with GN that were not treated with gene therapy and on mice without GN. Okay. So basically, we're standardizing the test in all ways. Okay. We're keeping the time intervals the same, and we're keeping a control, the mice without GN. 
so to see how normal mice behave and then we're comparing mice with gn that receive treatment and that don't receive treatment okay they were all kept in the same conditions this is an interesting experiment from the results some Students concluded that giving the mice with GN one dose of gene therapy had a benefit but did not cure the mice. Okay, this is really important. Gene therapy does not cure a person or an animal. Okay. Typically, maybe is this recessive or dominant? It's a recessive disease. It's easier to treat, but cure is not possible because cells will die at some point, right? We need to repeat the therapy. The results of the rotor tests were not affected by the age of mice. Hmm. Discuss whether each of these two conclusions is justified by the data. So I don't agree with age. Because think about it. As age increases, the mean time balance on moving platforms also increases. So it does help in a sense. Also, what about the first one? Giving the mice with GN one dose of gene therapy had a benefit but did not cure the mice. Okay, wait, wait. So, this bold line, sorry, I misread. This bold line, this is, these are mice without GN. So, yeah, the results of rotor tests were not affected by age. This is totally wrong because as they grow older, for mice without GN, it seems that uh, mean time increases. But with m mice that have GN, right, it seems that mean time is, you know, decreasing. What does this mean? It means that the disease is progressing towards a worse aspect. This is bad for the mice. So it does have an effect. What about the first assumption? Giving the mice with GN one dose of gene therapy had a benefit but did not cure the mice. Okay. So one dose. So uh, this one, the one with dashes. Um, the one with dashes, right? They have higher times than these. This is true. But they were not cured, actually. Because they are not performing as well as the mice without GN. And also, one more thing. After some time, they are going back to the same condition. So, there are two keywords here. Like, they are not performing as better or as good as the mice without GN. And over time, they are deteriorating to a much worse condition. Just like the ones without therapy. So, let's talk about these conditions. I totally agree with them. Let's just justify it, okay? So, I'm going to talk about why it had a benefit. Let's talk about the benefit. Mainly because mice with therapy have a higher balance time. So, you can either say this or you could go for mice with therapy think about it what what happened to the rate of decline the gradient is less steep right so it was a benefit mice with therapy for mice with therapy the rate of decline of balance time is slower or you could say less steep initially or at the start okay so that's the benefit however let's talk about why there is no cure why is there no cure but or it does not cure the mice why because at the end at the end the one i was talking about mice with therapy and mice without therapy with and without therapy or with no therapy have the same or similar you know have the same or have similar balance time okay or you could say at 23 months the in the end phase Or you could just say that mice with therapy have lower balance times compared with mice without GN, the one I was talking about. These are alternate answers. Mice with therapy have lower 
balance time compared to normal mice mice without gn right or there was another one that mice with therapy have a decrease in balance time that wasn't supposed to happen right or you know have a downwards trend so we just got two marks by the way one for the blue ones and one for this purple one now what let's talk about age so we're gonna reject this i mean we're gonna accept this wait they said we're not affected so we're gonna reject this right they are affected age affects reading how basically mice without gn increase balance time with age or we could say balance time decreases for mice with gn with age so basically the important thing is you can repeat points if you wrote both of these expecting you're getting more marks it's not it's the same point you need to understand then there are alternate value points like coaching data or saying that we are not sure because a statistical test is needed to confirm you know like to see if there's a significant difference or not now or we could just give data there was a complete sheet in the mark scheme i can give you an example like let's compare uh mice without gn okay at 23 months maybe 23 months so at 23 months mice without gn have a value of so this is 120 right this is 140 so where is 150 this is 150 this is 150 so each small box it's like 152 154 156 right so this is at 152 154 it's at 154 so this is at 154 and what about the one with therapy this is 40 right so 44 46 i mean 44 48 50 52 54 56 it's at 56 so at 23 months mice without gn it was at 154 seconds and mice with gn plus therapy was at 56 seconds what about mice with gn without therapy it was just a bit below it was at 52 seconds right one box below no therapy it was at 52 seconds okay so see if you guys get this i think you need three quotes right you need three quotes you could also find out rate by the way that's also allowed okay so let's go to question three now oh by the way from this year section b was excluded totally we only have section a one section they wanted consistency between all papers and also you do not have a choice anymore you have to answer all questions the red blood cells of people with sickle cell anemia have reduced oxygen carrying capacity explain the relationship between the gene mutation that causes sickle cell anemia and the reduced oxygen carrying capacity of red blood cells hmm. what happens basically this is a mutation on the beta globin chain there are four chains in hemoglobin two alpha and two beta and it happens on the sixth amino acid what happens basically 
a polar amino acid glutamic acid changes to valine this is the main problem so sickle cell anemia is a homozygous recessive disorder okay what actually happens it is a mutation on beta beta globin okay or you could say on the beta polypeptide that also works or the hbb allele you could talk about the hbb allele okay or gene what happens the a mutation is basically a spontaneous change right to the base sequence so it, what is this type of mutation is it addition deletion no it's actually substitution base substitution or you know nucleotide substitution occurs or you could talk about this being a missense mutation okay this is a missense mutation not nonsense because we are not getting a stop codon it's a missense mutation or you could just say that it's a change in the triplet or trip just the codon right or you could go for you could opt for GAG turns to GTG or more simply A turns to T adenine goes to thymine right so what's the consequence a base substitution actually causes a change in the amino acid sequence okay what actually happens due to the base substitution glutamic acid changes to valine you could also say this okay so these two points are correlated what are the end results the problem is valine is nonpolar so it causes a change in the 3d shape or tertiary structure you know 3 shape or tertiary structure of the protein or you know the quaternary structure or globular structure everything else works anything else works yeah okay so now what what is the end goal like uh, we talked about the molecular level now what happens at a bigger level what's the issue afterwards mainly now hemoglobin has a lower affinity for oxygen okay it becomes less soluble or sticky Hemoglobin becomes less soluble or sticks together, right? Or we can say it forms fibers in red blood cells, okay? So ultimately, RBCs, red blood cells, become sickle shaped. I think there are alternate varying points, varying points as well, like they get stuck in capillaries and stuff, etc. People with sickle cell anemia may need a blood transfusion. One risk associated with a blood transfusion is a condition known as transfusion associated circulatory overload. TACO. So, TACO is caused by a large increase in blood volume over a short period of time. This increase in blood volume can be harmful. TAC, okay? Predict the effect of an increase in blood volume on ADH secretion. Look at the transition. They just went to the chapter on hormones and state one consequence for kidney function of this change in ADH secretion. So the osmo receptors in the hypothalamus, they're going to detect this change. The increase in volume, uh, it's going to cause the osmo receptors to expand, right? And it's not going to secrete ADH anymore because we want to get rid of the uh, volume, right? We want diuresis, not antidiuresis. So mainly what's going to happen? This will actually decrease. There will be a decrease in ADH rate or decrease in ADH secretion and reduce water absorption. Where is the site of action of ADH? On the walls of chitin duct, right? Reduce water absorption in the collecting duct. Okay. 
or you could opt for a decrease in ADH results in increased volume of or you could say dilute urine okay anything works one feature of TSA is an increase in fluid entering the alveoli which makes it difficult to breathe hmm. this increase in fluid can be caused by an increase in blood pressure in the pulmonary capillaries that surround the alveoli What is this called? Pulmonary edema. Okay, so just how an increase in blood pressure in the pulmonary capillaries can cause fluid to enter the alveoli. Okay, so mainly what happens in ultrafiltration, right? Since there's high hydrostatic, hydrostatic pressure, water is forced from the glomerulus into the Bowman's capsule. So we just need to say that fluid or water is formed. Sorry, forced. My bad. from blood into alveoli really important guys people with kidney disease may be at high risk of taco following a blood transfusion a study carried out in 2019 investigated whether there is a link between kidney disease and TACO this study included data from 200 people who developed TACO after blood transfusion 405 people who did not develop TACO after blood transfusion the people in study were put into one of four categories people with acute kidney disease, kidney injury, chronic or long-term kidney disease, CKD, who do not require dialysis, people with chronic kidney disease who require dialysis, and people who do not have kidney disease. So it's acute, two forms of chronic, severe chronic disease. In dialysis, a machine is used to carry out the function of the kidneys. Yeah, we know that. Now, think about it. With reference to 3 point, describe the effect of having kidney disease on the risk of developing TACO. Suggest reasons for this effect. Clearly, as you can see, if you have no kidney disease, you are less likely to develop TACO, clearly. But if you do have kidney disease, you are more likely to uh, you know, develop TACO. However, check this out like for some reason chronic kidney disease with dialysis has a lower percentage than no kidney disease and for some reason acute kidney injury has more uh, has the highest percentage so this is interesting okay so let's talk about this so basically what's the general trend having kidney disease increases the risk of taco. I'm just gonna call it taco from now. We can talk about acute kidney injury. It has the highest risk of taco. Okay. Transfusion associated circulatory overload. Now we can just support this using a data code. It has a percentage of 32%. 32%, okay? 32% of people who developed TACO. All right, cool. So, we're describing we're using figure three point to describe the effect now we can suggest some reasons why this happens think about it if your kidney is injured you will be less likely to less able to get rid of the water right so kidney disease reduces ability to remove excess water right so what happens more water is retained and blood volume increases right so what is the reason behind ckd plus d so dialysis right there 
getting help with the machine it actually uh, reduces the effects of that okay so we can say that ckd plus dialysis has less risk of developing tsco why as dialysis helps to restore water volume okay hopefully that makes sense now people who are at a high risk of developing tsco following a blood transfusion can be given a type of drug called a loop diuretic in normal urine production 99 percent of sodium ions in the glomerular filtrate are reabsorbed and one person are excre excreted in urine production and in of people who take loop diuretics 80 percent of sodium ions in the glomerular filtrate are reabsorbed and 20 percent are excreted Explain how loop diuretics affect water reabsorption in the kidneys and suggest why this reduces the risk of developing TSCO after a blood transfusion. Guys, electrolytes are the most important in our body. If there's an imbalance, you die. Oh, by the way, you could also give a data quote in the previous one. It wasn't essential, but you could give a data quote. Okay. So think about it. If less sodium is absorbed into the body, less water will follow it, right? By osmosis. So, fever, sodium ions reabsorbed, or we can say that more sodium ions in filtrate. So, what happens? This actually, this decreases water potential. This decreases water potential of filtrate or it actually increases the water potential of the medulla of the kidney right this is the kidney we have some pyramid shaped structures here which leads to the nephron the nephrons ultimately flow into the correcting tubules and correcting ducts and then it goes to form the ureter over time, right? After the hyla of the kidney, right? So we have a medulla and a cortex. So if less ions are reabsorbed, more stay in the nephrons, right? In the glomerular filtrate inside the tubes. Typically, 99% are reabsorbed. But since they're in the filtrate, this actually decreases the water potential of the filtrate. And since water is not reabsorbed back into the medulla, I mean, since Na plus are not reabsorbed back into the medulla, water does not follow, right? So water potential actually increases since there are fewer ions there in the medulla. Most of the ions are in the filtrate, not in the medulla, okay? So we need to talk about osmosis. Less water reabsorbed by osmosis, or you could say down the water potential gradient, and this ultimately increases volume of urine. So blood volume from transfusion is reduced, okay? Make sure you get that. This is how the structure looks like. This is the Bowman's capsule with the glomerulus. We have the PCT. Followed by the loop of Henley, right? Followed by the DCT and stuff over here, right? So basically, if less sodium ions get out, think about it. If less sodium ions get out, most of them remain in the filtrate over here, right? So this is the medulla over here. If less flow out into the medulla, the water potential of the medulla actually increases and the water potential of the filtrate decreases, okay? So let's go to number four. Meiosis is an important process that contributes to genetic variation in a population. Figure 4.1 shows a pair of homologous chromosomes during prophase of meiosis, prophase one of meiosis. On figure 4.1, use a letter. Use a letter C with label line to identify where crossing over occurs. Okay, so what is crossing over? It is the exchange of genetic material between 
non-sister chromatids of homologous chromosomes so it's occurring over here this section over here so this is c okay describe how crossing over produces genetic variation okay let's go so crossing over is between non sister chromatids so non sister chromatids have different combinations of alleles I told you there's an exchange so exchange of alleles actually occur and the chromatids they become recombinant or we say that the chromatids have new combinations of alleles that were previously not present do you understand alleles that were previously not present so linkage is also broken down by the way autosomal linkage linkage groups broken and uh, gametes have unique right gametes have unique combination of alleles and also random fusion of gametes occur right so that gives us more variation so what are the sources of variation crossing over independent assortment random fusion of gametes and mutations so how does crossing over help? Mainly because of exchange of alleles, new recombinant forms are produced and also autosomal linkage is broken. We get new variations that were never present before. And also new gametes, different gametes are formed and there is random fusion of those as well, right? Th these are the basics, okay. Wing pattern in the butterfly, heliconius, melpomene is controlled by genes on autosomal chromosomes. The gene for banding pattern on the upper wing has two alleles, a dominant allele coding for a full band, a recessive allele coding for a broken band. The gene for ray pattern on the lower wing has two alleles, a dominant allele coding for rays, a recessive allele coding for no rays. Okay, so we have full bands, broken bands, and rays, no rays. Scientists crossed a butterfly that was homozygous dominant for both genes with a butterfly that was homozygous recessive for both genes. Okay, so scientists crossed a butterfly that was homozygous dominant for both with a butterfly that was homozygous recessive for both genes. The scientists wanted to check whether the phenotype ratio for offspring the F2 generation agreed with the expected phenotype ratio of 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1, the one we typically expect, right? So, this is what we got. Okay. Full band race broken band no rays so do we have letters let's see if okay let's just make letters so i'm going to call this uh, b and that r okay so this was b b r r b b r r okay so this was b small b we we got a gamut of this over here this over here and this should be capital R smaller okay so what would we expect in the F2 generation the 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1 ratio right because there are four gametes possible this 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 one and this one these four it won't match when exactly if there's linkage or something then it won't match so our goal is to compare the expected and observed values how do we do this using the chi-square test explain the term f1 generation interesting so this is in the course book we should define it as this is the first f for first f1 first generation of offspring from a parental cross 
and one more thing parents right have to be homozygous or true bread or we say that they must be pure bread okay pure breeding and the f1 generation will be heterozygous really important guys the scientists use the chi-square test to check the expectation observe one so let's find this out how much did we expect since this is 3 this is also 3 right so we're gonna expect the same values this is gonna be 25.5 now let's subtract 8 minus 25.5 that's minus 17.5 whole square we get rid of the minus sign right 306.25 by the expected 25.5 since all answers are to two decimal places this should be 12.01 if rounded off properly okay I got 12.0098 we just rounded off to 12.01 so chi-square it's actually the summation of this observed minus ex expected whole square by um, e so 6.62 plus 0.79 plus 0.03 plus 12.01 that gives us an answer of 19.45 okay here we go now the critical value at 0.05 was 7.81 so the logic is if your calculated value is greater than the critical value at 5% this is the value we typically use for a bio or any scientific experiment to be honest you'll find this in paper, paper 5 most of the time so since our value right since our calculated value is greater than the critical value this means that it was not due to chance if it was less than this it meant that it was more likely due to chance it may have occurred in you know it may have occurred 95 percent of the time but if your value is greater than this this means that it does not occur 95 percent of the time it occurs five percent of the times in the experiments which is very unlikely but if it's less than the value it occurs 95 percent of the times it's totally normal five percent is due to chance but since our value 19.45 is greater than the critical value 7.81 these values this is not normal there is significant difference between the two so it is not due to chance rather there is some other factor determining this so 19.45 is greater than the critical value okay at p is equal to five percent so results are or observed ratio is significantly different to expected ratio so differences are not due to chance okay why what may be a cause Oh, that's in part four so here we just need to say that why did it not match what's the problem like why does it not fit the nine is to three is to three is to one ratio so think about it we actually expected it to be 25.5 right for these we got 21 and 8 instead and this one was 8.5 this was pretty close right but what was the issue mainly we see an issue here and we see an issue here the full band and raise that one is too high and the broken band and raise that one is too low so we can talk about this this is due to an increase in the full band phenotypes or 
a decrease in the you know broken band okay clear all right why will they not match i was telling you guys there may be epistasis one may be one may not be expressed at all there may be linkage right there may be a lethal allele you know this we say that in inbreeding depression there is a chance of two harmful recessive alleles coming together that they're talking about that lethal so it may have been due to chance like you know we're not completely ruling it out 95 percent five percent may have been due to chance even though 95 percent was not due to chance it was for some other reason but there's always a chance right there may be a chance deviation chance deviations right some other environmental factor may be the reason or you know mutations may have occurred and small sample size so we cannot actually draw a conclusion okay so remember these don't forget them how many questions were there in the question paper Ten. We're at five right now. Fat rate can be made as a recombinant human protein. Genetic engineering, right? Name the disease that is treated using recombinant factor eight. So till now, I I'm I'm gonna say that the question paper is quite easy, relatively simple. So the disease called disease is called hemophilia A, right? The all disease. Before recombinant DNA, I mean factor 8 was available, this disease was treated with factor 8 from donated blood. Give two advantages of using recombinant human factor 8 instead of factor 8 from donated blood to treat this disease. Okay. Common question again, right? We can go for mass production or, you know, large or unlimited supplies possible there is no risk of infection you know rather than using an animal or something as we see in insulin or from donated blood like somebody else if we take donated blood from somewhere else he or she may have malaria or something hiv or something right no risk of infection uh, no or fewer ethical issues right less chance of rejection or immune response or allergic response side effects right also this is cheaper cheaper or quick to produce what else there's no need to wait for donor or you know we don't need to be dependent on the donor the gene that goes for human factor 8 can be synthesized from messenger RNA purified from human liver cells. Name the enzyme that uses RNA to make cDNA, right? We know this. It is reverse transcriptase. Okay, next. Outline two sources other than messenger mRNA from which genes can be obtained for genetic engineering. Interesting. Good question. So this is the best way to do so because it saves us a lot of trouble. So there are two other ways. I always teach this in class. We can either synthesize it in the lab from nucleotides or we can cut the genes from donor DNA, which is really hard to do. So one way is genes cut from donor DNA, right? Another way is genes synthesized chemically. from nucleotides okay interesting the gene that codes for human factor 8 can be transferred into mammalian cells in tissue culture explain why promoter also this was so simple they're touching the key points okay this was a very good question like why does a promoter also need to be transferred into the mammalian cells so that human factor 8 can be synthesized basically um The gene that codes from human factor can be transferred into mammalian cells in tissue culture. 
A promoter is responsible for the initiation of transcription. Since the promoter, the RNA polymerase actually binds to promoter, or else transcription cannot begin, right? That's the main reason. And transcription factors as well. So, so the promoter, the promoter is required for gene expression or we could say to initiate or to start transcription okay why how exactly so that transcription factors like some ions can bind to promoter this is only present in eukaryotes by the way not prokaryotes also one more thing so rna polymerase rna polymerase can bind to promoter also last thing there's an alternate value point to produce the correct quantity you know or so that it is inducible it is only required when needed right so that we can control the amount produced or we can have the promoter for the marker gene to show gene transfer successful because guys think about this basically uh, marker gene like gfp green fluorescent protein right just because it's there doesn't mean you'll see fluorescence you need to make the protein right so a promoter needs to be attached with that as well if it's not attached right then we can't actually know if the transfer is successful or not right next number six the, the banana plant musa acuminata is a tall herbaceous plant with very large leaves an investigation was carried out to measure the net carbon dioxide uptake by the banana plant at different light intensities clearly this is a question on limiting factors initially carbon dioxide or light intensity is a limiting factor but after 10,000 lux it's not anymore so describe and explain the results at a light intensity of 1000 lux okay 1000 they're talking about this point so this is at this is minus 1 right so it's at minus 1.6 basically so the net carbon dioxide uptake is negative what does this actually mean we are losing more co2 than we are taking in sorry since it's negative uptake is negative right so if uptake was positive what does that mean we're taking in more carbon dioxide than we're producing okay that means that we are taking more carbon dioxide than that than we're giving out so what if uptake is negative what does that mean we are not actually taking in more we are actually giving out more okay if it was positive we would be taking in more than we're giving out from respiration here respiration is at a higher rate right than photosynthesis so we are actually giving out more co2 than we're taking in co2 okay let's explain this let's describe first so co2 uptake is below zero or we could say that co2 is released or co2 uptake is negative right or you could just quote the value co2 uptake is minus 1.6 micromole micromole per meter square per second okay next why is that so because light intensity is low due to low light intensity little 
photosynthesis is occurring it's not like photosynthesis has completely stopped it's just that less is occurring the rate of respiration is more right that's another point i can see the maximum rate of respiration is higher than rate of photosynthesis we've seen questions like these recently right these are common with reference to figure 6.2 describe and explain what can be concluded from the graph at light intensities of between 2000 and 7000 lux okay 2000 and 7000 So as we're increasing light intensity, uh, net carbon dioxide uptake is also in increasing. What does this mean? Photosynthesis is increasing, right? That's the explanation. And we can give some data quotes. Initially, what was the value? Think about it. Initially, it was at this value of minus 0 0.2. Then it went to a value of six point two, six point four, six point five, right? 6.5, okay. So let's describe and explain. So initially as light intensity increases, rate of CO2 uptake also increases. This is our first point. Then we give a data quote. At 2000 lux, it is at minus 0 0.2 micromole per meter square per second at 7000 lux it's at 6.5 micromole per meter square per second okay now an explanation why this is because rate of photosynthesis rate of photosynthesis light dependent reaction and light independent reaction increases anything right you can say any one i'm just writing all of them so at this point since it's increasing and rate is also increasing who is the limiting factor light intensity is the limiting factor okay okay got it that's all explain why the rate of carbon dioxide uptake levels off as light intensity increases above 10000 Typical reason light intensity is no longer a limiting factor, something else is, right? So light intensity is no longer uh, uh you shouldn't say uh is no longer the right, it's the no longer the limiting factor. Um or you could say something else, like something else like CO2 concentration, you know or like temp temperature is the limiting factor okay that is all picture plants are carnivorous plants that trap and digest insects yes. seems like somebody we know the venus flytrap they differ in action though mainly inside the picture plant there's like this fluid which is toxic it has enzymes hydrolytic enzymes which digests the animal Unlike the Venus flytrap, picture plants have no moving parts to trap insects. Insects are attached, attracted to scent produced at the top of the pitcher. Once inside the pitcher, the insect slides down to the bottom. They slip, basically, and into a liquid containing digestive enzymes. So just a type of enzyme found in the pitcher plant that is used to digest insects. So here we're going to use hydrolytic. This is the word. Or we could say extracellular enzymes. Or we could say, you know proteases protein ases or peptide ases basically they break peptide bonds pitcher plants grow in bogs and wet grasslands where the soil has low concentration of minerals such as nitrates the plants obtain nitrates from the digestion of insects calvin cycle intermediates are used to synthesize more complex compounds some of which need nitrogen from nitrates name one compound that needs nitrogen from nitrates and name the calvin cycle intermediate from which it is synthesized okay 
this is very important remember let's talk about the Kelvin cycle what actually happens uh, carbon dioxide is fixed with or to RU BP ribulose bisphosphate using Rubisco so it forms a six carbon intermediate which is unstable it forms a three carbon intermediate two of them which is also unstable then it forms a GP GP breaks down to form TP TP now has two roots five sixth of that is converted back to so from GP we get TP so five six goes back to form RUBP but what about one sixth it forms other products required for the plant so what are the typical biomolecules carbohydrates uh, lipids and proteins right so which one actually contains uh, nitrogen clearly amino acids or you can go for proteins or polypeptides anything works okay or you could also go for uh, nucleotides that is also valid and what is the intermediate actually you could actually go for both GP right which is glycerate glycerate 3 phosphate or you could just opt for triose triose phosphate TP okay next we are off to question 7 this is a broad question like section B has been removed right so they're giving you seven more questions now instead you have seven, eight, nine, and ten. Uh, these aren't that big. We're almost done. So, for seven, we need to describe the process of oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, let's go. So, at first, what happens? Reduced NAD, right? Reduced NAD, or you can offer reduced FAD, actually release hydrogen or you can talk about release hydrogen like you can talk about hydrogen splitting up hydrogen splits into protons and electrons okay hydrogen splits into protons and electrons now what basically uh, the electrons flow along the electron transport chain where is this located in the inner membrane inner mitochondrial membrane okay so electrons where is this occurring by the way this whole process is occurring in the matrix okay now what happens the electrons pass through the electron transport chain we can call it the ETC where is it located at the inner mitochondrial membrane or Christie okay so why why does this happen mainly the purpose is to release energy so energy is released by doing so and what do we do with this energy this is used to pump I'm gonna give you an overview of the process suppose this is the mitochondrion okay it has an inner membrane and an outer it's a double membrane double membrane organelle so it's like this so what happens inside this is the matrix right matrix so basically NAD and FAD reduced NAD and FAD they release hydrogen hydrogen splits to form protons and electrons so the electron actually flows through this chain right it gives energy it has a lot of energy initially so when it flows down the cha chain think of it as a ball going down a hill what will happen the gravitational potential energy is released right so for the electron it's actually electric potential energy is released what do we do with that energy H plus is actually pumped into this IMS the intermembrane space so wh what's the purpose of doing this why is it pumped inside 
because the inner membrane is actually impermeable to protons. Do you understand? So if it's impermeable, it can't come back into the stroma from into the matrix. I mean, from the inner membrane space, there is only one way to come back through. What exactly? Some stocked particles called ATP synthase, and in the process of doing so, ATP is produced. So this is used actively, right, to pump protons. or you could say transfer protons through inner membrane into the intermembrane space. Okay, now what? A proton gradient is established. A proton gradient is established or you can say that there is a high proton concentration in the intermembrane space. I'm just using a short form, okay? You guys need to write the whole thing. Now what? So, the only way that protons diffuse back, right? Using facilitated diffusion. Protons diffuse through ATP synthase and ATP is produced from ADP and inorganic phosphate. This is called oxidative phosphorylation or chemiosmosis. chemiosmosis. And oxygen acts as the final electron acceptor in the chain, okay, to form water really important so without oxygen chemiosmosis cannot occur remember that oxidative phosphorylation so this is the whole marking scheme be sure to memorize it i wrote 11 marking points you need to give at least seven from here okay let's go next in experiment on respiration two different populations of yeast cells were used a and b uh yeast cells had no mitochondria yeast cells in b had mitochondria so, if you do not have mitochondria, what can occur only? Glycolysis in the cytoplasm, right? Both populations were provided with glucose in solution. And the concentration of ATP was measured every minute for several, for seven minutes. Describe and explain the difference in results between population A and population B as shown in figure 7.1. So clearly, B is much better. They both start from the same point. But population B produces more ATP than population A, clearly. Also think about it, it becomes steeper later on, right? So, production of ATP increases at a higher rate for population B, just cheaper in general than for population A. We can actually give a data quote, for example, you know, at five, right? Or at six, let's talk about six. At six min A B. So A is at okay, so this is thirty. This is twenty-two, twenty-four, twenty-six. It looks like looks like a bit more than 22 you can write 22 but it should be 23 micromole per dmq what about b b is at b is at 100 clearly but now we we just gave descriptions right so let's explain why is b so much better 
Okay, wait, wait, wait. So this I was misinterpreting the question. No, no, I did not. It's fine. Sorry. So the expression is population B carries out glycolysis, right? Glycolysis or you know substrate. linked okay you cannot say level anymore linked phosphorylation clearly and oxidative phosphorylation like both okay it's carrying out both but population a only carries out glycolysis okay or you could say substrate linked phosphorylation or you could say fermentation right that works as well or it cannot carry out oxidative phosphorylation right because it does not have mitochondria okay okay we have three more questions remaining eight nine and ten natural selection and artificial selection both have important roles in evolutionary change seahorses are fish with an unusual appearance and many specialized features we see a seahorse Two species of seahorse, Hippocampus erectus and H. zosteria zosteri, are found in the coastal waters of the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean Sea. It is thought that these two species of seahorse have a common ancestor. The ranges of the two species overlap in many areas. Male and female seahorses stay together for the whole of the breeding season. H. erectus is much larger than H. zosteri. Hippocampus zosteri. Few seahorses occur that are intermediate in size between the two species. Okay. So, use this information to name and explain the type of speciation that may have occurred in the evolution of these two species. Speciation is of two types. Allopatric and sympatric speciation. Okay. So, they are found in two different waters, coastal waters, right? One is in the Gulf of Mexico, Mexico, right? And the other is in the Caribbean Sea. Okay. So, mainly, we need to think about geographical barriers. Is there a geographical barrier or not? That's the main point. Okay. So, if it's allopatric speciation, it is due to ge a geographical barrier. Okay, due to different selection pressures. However, think about this. That usually happens when a certain animal cannot cross the sea or something. So if you want to see a picture, check this. <laughs> you need some info on geography for this, clearly. Um, hear me out. Here, check this. Like typically a student would think of uh, geographical barriers, right? Since there are two different water bodies. But actually, the Gulf of Mexico and Caribbean Sea, they're actually connected. Okay? So there is no geographical barrier. Okay? So if there is no geographical barrier, it has to be sympatric speciation. Okay? So it is sympatric speciation. So sympatric speciation, it also has two parts under it. One is behavioral. One is behavioral isolation. And the other is reproductive, reproductive isolation. Okay. And we can say why it is, why it is sympatric. Basically because no geographical barrier okay pretty straightforward or we can say that they are not geographically isolated more like a geography exam sadly for many years uh, farmers have used selective breeding to improve the yield milk yield of dairy cattle and to improve the yield of crops explain why improving milk yields in cattle by selective breeding, selective breeding can be more challenging than improving yield of crops okay mainly think about this cattle right 
they take a longer time to grow or mature. That's the main problem. Clearly, that's the main problem. So, cattle take longer time to grow or mature. Plus, there are fewer of spring, you know, per cross. And think about it, males don't even produce milk. The feature can only be measured in about 50% of spring. Or in females only, right? In females only. And milk yield must be measured over a period of time, right? It takes, yeah, like you can measure milk once. You need to measure it over a period of time. That's another issue. There are also other ethical issues because um, cows are living, cattle are living, right? But plants are as well, but the ethical issues aren't involved with them. Also, there may be, you know, it is difficult to identify suitable males for using crosses. Because males don't produce milk. Like, how are we gonna know they're the bit? They have the good genes, right? We don't know for sure. Also, cattle require more care or support, or you could say it is more expensive. Also, there's an added risk of it's like more dangerous to carry out breeding of large cattle okay this is really important state two reasons or two examples of crop features that may be improved by state two breeding to increase the yield of crops okay we have multiple points available it can be mass quantity or size What else? Maybe disease resistance can be conferred. Pest resistance, you know, resistance to insects or pests. Rate of growth. Drought resistance. Then herbicide resistance, right? Resistance to herbicides, resistance to flooding, winds, etc. These are points, okay? Okay, so describe the biological species concept. Hmm. So they're talking about reproductive isolation here and what is a species basically. So individuals within a population can breed, mate or reproduce to produce fertile offspring. Okay. And they are reproductively isolated from other species or you could explain what this means okay like if they try to mate with another species if they're possible if it's possible to mate they will produce infertile species that means they are a different species actually so just when the morphological species concept is more why when the morphological species concept is more useful than biological species concept so morphology what does it refer to the external physical characteristics okay so, 
Like, basically, it's to save time. What does this actually mean, morphological species concept? Mainly, you're going to look at them. Like, suppose you're looking at a lizard and a monkey. Clearly, they can't mate, right? Clearly. They don't have the physical capacity to mate. So, it's going to save time because sometimes, you know, uh, looking at their reproductive pattern is really time consuming. Okay. And also for organisms that do not breed sexually. Okay. Or organisms that are a asexual. Okay. What else? For fossils or extinct organisms and when morphological differences are easier to determine okay we just had to read one point there was one one point on it right what's the other point it may take too long time or it may not be possible to make them mate, right? Anything else? Often not possible to observe reproductive behavior, okay? That's all. Compare the characteristics of members of domain Archaea domain bacteria so hear me out guys it's domain kingdom domain is at the top right domain kingdom phylum class order family genus species so domain is at the top there are three domains eukarya archaea and bacteria archaea and bacteria both of them are prokaryotes and eukarya by their name you know that they're eukaryotes so let's talk about them let's talk about similarities and differences it's quite simple actually straightforward so mainly similarities include both are prokaryotes or you could say that the same point both have no nucleus or you know membrane bound organelles then both have circular DNA both have 70s ribosomes both reproduce by binary fission or you know budding fragmentation so i wrote four marking points but sadly we could get a maximum of three because the four mark question we need to talk about differences as well okay so basically bacteria have a silver right so bacteria cell wall made of peptidoglycan what is it? Here, my glycoprotein. It's mainly a protein with a carbohydrate side chain. Glycoprotein. The one that's at the end is the main part. So, peptidoglycan. It's mainly a carbohydrate with a protein side chain. So, bacteria cell wall is made of peptidoglycan, whereas archaea cell wall does not have peptidoglycan. Okay. Next, um, they have different ribosomal RNA, rRNA basically. So, bacteria actually form spores, okay, but archaea do not. There's one last point. 
What is a sport though, if you guys are curious? Basically, a spore is a dormant, tough, non-reproductive structure produced by some bacteria, okay? What is the last point? Let's talk about the cell membrane. In bacteria, the cell membrane has ester-linked lipids, but archaea has ether-linked lipids, okay? So, if we talk about the cell membrane for bacteria, it's ester linked lipids for archaea it's ether linked lipids right so ester for bacteria and ether for archaea okay last question then uh, we have two guard cells shown what are a b and c so c is clearly the cell wall however uh, if you Misinterpreted as the cell surface membrane, it's fine. They give you marks, it's okay. A is a chloroplast, and B is our vacuole. Okay, now in terms of water stress, abscisic acid is released, it's the plant stress hormone, right? This results in the closure of stomata to reduce water loss by transpiration. Describe the role of ABA. Let's go. So, how does it actually act? Abscisic acid actually binds to receptors on cell surface membrane of guard cell I was actually talk thinking of this question thing that may come in the Majun series but they gave it in the March trip one so they may give auxins in the Majun series right and what other broad questions are there? They they may give cyclic phosphorylation or non-cyclic ph phosphorylation, right? Instead of oxidative phosphorylation. They may talk about the transmission of a signal ac along a neuron or across from one neuron to another, which is the synapse, right? They may give the uh, sliding filament model as well, so you should learn that properly, okay? So this is how all hormones act, literally. So what actually happens? What are the actions? So proton pumps, right? Proton pumps are inhibited, OK? So it also stimulates, abscisic acid stimulates calcium ion uptake. Or it opens CA2 plus channels. Why? CA2 plus acts as a second messenger. K plus diffuses out of the K plus diffuser out of the guard cell, right? So if K plus diffuser out of the guard cell, what happens to the water potential of the guard cell? It actually increases, right? So water actually flows out. Water potential. of guard cell increases right now water leaves the guard cell by osmosis or you could say down the water potential gradient and ultimately the guard cell becomes flaccid or you could say cell volume decreases so stoma closes so what's the ultimate consequence since the stoma closes or stomata close basically less water is lost less transpiration occurs and they can survive moments of stress okay so tell me if, if you have any problems you can ask me and tell me if you need paper 5 as well okay